SpaceX Starship second attempt, the aftermath. So what exactly happened? Let's go check it out. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again joining me for Tea Time. Today I have a little bit of uh, something super secret. <laughs> G14 Classified. It's a new blend for Dark Moon Teas that I'm coming out with for the holidays, as I promised you guys. So they'll be pre-ordering uh, happening this week. Hang in there for that. Anyways, I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, hanging out, talking tech, talking photo, talking video. Today is a technology day. We're gonna be talking about the Starship. It's launched this weekend, just a couple days ago on Saturday, which I covered live on JC Live. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. Thank you guys for joining me. There was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you guys there. I think there's like three, 4,000 people have seen it already. Anyways, it was a lot of fun. I wanna go through it with you. What happened? What went right? What went wrong? We're gonna break it down kind of minute by minute what happened. And I hope you enjoy this. It was a lot of fun putting it together. So the idea here was the IFT or the Integrated Flight Test Part Two, which would be that Starship number two or second attempt went off on Saturday. And bear in mind, this thing was a ship or a rocket that stood at about 400 feet tall, the largest rocket ever launched from Earth. Pretty amazing. And it was holding over 10 million pounds of fuel to get this massive rocket off the ground with 33 Raptor engines actually firing this time was just awe-inspiring. The only thing better that I can think of is actually being there and feeling that ground just rattling. Just That's just the most amazing thing. I remember back in the day with the space shuttles when they launched off the Space Coast here, only about three hours away from me. When we would go there as a kid to see the space shuttle launch, you can actually feel the earth underneath you just rumbling. The sound is just amazing. It's just so exhilarating. Anyways, I wish I could have been there for this IFT part two, but I wasn't but I was able to cover it. The main two tests was the launch pad that it actually held together and didn't disintegrate this time, as well as what they call hot staging, where the last time the two stages, you have your booster rocket and the Starship didn't come apart and it just started tumbling, tumbling and they had to blow it up. Anyways, those were the two things that they really wanted to test and they did test them and things went well. Now the rocket was supposed to launch on Friday morning, but it didn't. The reason being is one of the grid fins failed and they had to replace one of the actuators. So they had to disassemble it and take the top portion, which is the Starship off and bring it back down and then fix that problem. At the time, we thought it was only going to be one replace, but they ended up replacing three out of the four. The reason being is since they had the Starship de-stacked anyways and brought back down, instead of just replacing one, they might as well replace three and that's what they did. So better safe than sorry. They ended up restacking the Starship on top of the booster and moving the launch date to the following day, which is Saturday, Saturday morning at 7.30 a.m. They were figuring on 7.30 going live with coverage and by eight o'clock, there should have been a launch. And that's exactly what ended up happening. By T minus one hour and 37 minutes before launch, the booster and Starship began filling with the rocket fuel, that liquid oxygen and liquid methane. By T minus 40 seconds, the countdown was paused as planned for some final checks. Now they had a 20 minute launch window, so they could have waited those 20 minutes going through all of the final checks, but it did not take that long. After a few minutes, the countdown once again resumed. By T minus five seconds, the water deluge system fired up like a massive shower head, pouring over 350,000 gallons of water over that launch pad during those few seconds that all 33 Raptor engines were fired up. 
By T minus two seconds, we can see the inner 13 engines ignite. By T minus one second, we can see 15 out of the 20 outer engines ignite. And a second later at T minus zero seconds, all 33 Raptor engines were on. Four seconds into the flight, the rocket was already off the launch pad and all 33 engines were firing perfectly. Now, unlike the first attempt when there was billowing sand and debris and chunks of concrete launching everywhere where you could barely see anything, this did not happen this time. The water deluge system worked perfectly, absolutely flawlessly. As we can see, the steam is shooting out in a distinct five-pronged pattern. It's not one big dust storm anymore. It is more controlled, much more controlled over the first attempt. Now by T plus 10 seconds, the rocket has already cleared the top of the launch pad. Now there was a noticeable difference between IFT1 and IFT2, and I made note of this during the JC Live event. The big difference that I saw was how clean the burn was. There was no smoke. There was no engines misfiring. All 33 were on. There was no multicolor flame or multicolor smoke pouring out of this rocket. So it was a 100% beautiful, clean burn, which really looked amazing. Now by T plus one minute and five seconds, the rocket reached max Q. What that basically is, is where the craft sustains the maximum amount of dynamic pressure. That is the difference between the static atmospheric pressure and the dynamic fuel pressure. So there's the maximum amount of load, let's say, on the craft. This is when things can really go bad very quickly. Now next came the most important part of the test, which is stage separation. Now, the last time this failed, right? We saw that it got hooked up, it did not detach, it started tumbling, and they had to blow it up. Well, they changed it from that type of stage separation to what they call hot staging. What that means is the rocket engines on the Starship fire up and push away from the booster. By two minutes and 50 seconds into the flight, all but three of the center Raptor engines shut down, just as they're supposed to do, and the clamp holding the Starship to the booster was released. At this point, the rocket is traveling at 5,600 kilometers per hour, around 74 kilometers above sea level. Now, all six engines on the Starship ignite, and gimbal pointing outward to divert the flame and impact of the engines through the gills of the hot staging connector to reduce the amount of impact on the top of the booster. As the separation happens, the booster begins to flip, pointing towards the Earth for re-entry. All 13 of the inner Raptor engines were meant to reignite, but this didn't happen. Now this is when things kind of went south and started unraveling. Now things get really quick here, all right? We're gonna slow things down and I'm gonna break it down for you. What happened? Now at T plus two minutes and 51 seconds, we see one out of the 13 engines are not firing back up. Three seconds later, by two minutes and 54 seconds, another engine cuts out. This time, one of the three center position engines. So now there's two out of 13 engines not firing. One second later, at two minutes, 55 seconds, yet another engine goes out. And then again, three seconds later, at two minutes and 58 seconds, yet another engine goes out, making it a grand total of four out of 13 not working. Now by three minutes, 12 seconds, another engine goes dark, making it five out of 13 engines not functioning. Two seconds later, another two Raptor engines meet their maker. That's seven out of 13 engines are dark. By three minutes and 18 seconds, all booster engines are out. Now, two seconds later, at three minutes and 20 seconds, the FTS activated the flight termination system, the self-destruct, let's call it, and it blew up the booster rocket. Now, there's been speculation on why this happened. Some were talking about the fuel during this maneuver, during this flipping maneuver, somehow got out of whack. There's a lot of speculation here, but until they go over all the data, we're not gonna know exactly why this happened. But 
At any rate, during this very small window of time, let's say 30 seconds, a lot happened. There was a lot of engines that were going out. Now, I seriously doubt that they were just failing just haphazardly. I'm going to guess that there's probably a fueling type of problem, just like speculation says, because I really can't see any other reason why the Raptor engines just started going dark. I don't think that they were just sitting there failing just because. I have a feeling that it really had something to do with fueling. It, they just were not getting fuel. Now, even though they did have to detonate the booster, the booster was far enough away from the starship that it didn't affect the starship. It didn't blow them both up, right? Which is a really fortunate thing. Now, moving into the starship, the starship continued as it should have with all of its engines lit going into orbit or let's say low Earth orbit around 150 kilometers or so. Everything was looking good, but we did see some sparks sparkles coming off it. Now what that was, we don't know. There is some speculation that it was heat tiles. Now when I looked at some of the photographs taken from the ground, you can clearly see that there was a lot of the heat tiles missing. Now this isn't a good thing. We know that from the space shuttle. Once some of those heat tiles come off during re-entry, it will heat up and it will blow up the craft. So we did see a lot of those tiles missing and they were missing right around the weld areas. We can see line patterns where they were missing, where they popped off. Now this is definitely something that SpaceX is going to have to work on because I don't even think that this thing would have made it back because I think it would have blew up on re-entry. That's just my opinion. Now by T plus five minutes, everything was called out as being nominal. Moving into T plus six minutes, once again, called off as being nominal. Everything was working as it should. Now by T plus seven minutes is when the problem started for Starship. It was traveling at about 18,000 kilometers per hour at an altitude of 149 kilometers. And we saw this plume of smoke or vapor. And by T plus seven minutes, 40 seconds, we saw another plume of smoke or vapor. Now the vehicle was traveling at 22,000 kilometers per hour at an altitude of 148 kilometers. Now remember, 148 kilometers, it was at 149 kilometers just 40 seconds ago. So something has gone wrong here because the speed has increased by 4,000 kilometers, yet the altitude has decreased by 1,000 kilometers. This is, I think, when things really started going south. By 10 seconds later, by T, seven minutes and 50 seconds, the smoke had cleared up, which was nice, thinking that everything was okay. Well not so fast. By T, eight minutes and four seconds, the speeds increased to 24,000 kilometers with an altitude remaining at 148 kilometers, but all engines were out. By T plus eight minutes and five seconds, a small plume of smoke or vapor was seen and all telemetry stopped. One second later, we saw a massive plume of smoke, which was obviously the FTS system or the flight termination system, the self-destruct, activating and blowing up the Starship. Now, what the reason was, we really don't know. Once again, just like with the booster rocket, they're gonna have to go through all the data to see exactly what went wrong. Now, we didn't get to see splashdown of the booster rocket, obviously, because it ended up blowing up. We also didn't see if the Starship was able to re-enter the atmosphere with all of those heat tiles missing. Would it have blown up anyways? I would probably say yes. Now, we're gonna have to wait around once again for the FAA to do their investigation to see what went wrong. And then we can't forget that we have to see the Fish and Wildlife Service walk around to check for debris, make sure there's no animals killed, check on the water quality, check on all of the ecology around there before they give approval for the next launch. Now, SpaceX is approved to launch more rockets this year. The question is, will they? Number one, will they be able to get approval from the FAA and from, of course, Fish and Wildlife and all the rest? Number one, also, will they really want to or are they going to focus, let's say, their attention on the Starbase, maybe adding another launch pad at the Starbase or maybe focusing on the Space Coast here in Florida, adding to that? 
to have another Starship be able to launch here out of Florida. What are they going to do? Where are they going to spend their time moving through the rest of 2023? We could see another launch if the FAA and Fish and Wildlife Services get their act together. It's a possibility because there are ships ready to go. My understanding is with the new ship that they're going to use, they've already used suction cups to test out all of the heat shielding to make sure those heat tiles don't come off. So this is very interesting. So they probably knew that there was a problem with these heat tiles already. Because if not, why would they be using suction cups to test the new ship out before they even launched this one when they didn't test the heat shielding on this one? So in my personal opinion, I think that SpaceX knew that this wasn't going to go over 100%. I don't think they thought that they were going to be able to get around the entire planet in those 90 minutes and splash down in the ocean and all the rest. I don't believe that they thought that was going to happen. That all being said, the two most important things here was that SpaceX was testing out, number one, the pad. Would the pad blow into pieces or would it not? Is that stainless steel? that they put on the launch pad, as well as that deluge system that blows 350,000 gallons of water in those five, six, eight seconds that all 33 Raptor engines are lit over it, would it work? And it did. We can see the water vapor just billowing out from the rocket with this nice, beautiful pattern to it, a five prong pattern. Instead of just a massive dust storm, it was very controlled. So the pad worked perfectly and that hot staging system that basically detaches the two, the booster from the Starship, worked perfectly also. They did not get stuck together like last time. Remember, this hot staging has been used by the Russians for countless, many decades, and it's worked. So, Elon said, hey, let's give that a shot. They put it together within a month or two, boom, it works. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love with SpaceX. They innovate and they iterate. They blow sh up, they innovate, and they iterate faster than we've seen ever before. When we see NASA taking 10 years to do something, SpaceX will do it in 10 months. So, like I said before, the FAA, the Fish and Wildlife, and all of these three-letter, all of these organizations need to start moving at the speed of innovation. And they're not right now, all right? And there's some things that are in the works that they're trying to get past that will definitely move these things faster, quicker forward. But how long is that going to take? I really don't know, but it needs to go quick because we see countries like China moving forward very quickly and not having any type of regulatory problems and just launching and launching and launching and launching. We saw last week they successfully landed a booster rocket, just like what SpaceX does. So once again, these regulatory organizations need to get off their laurels. They need to start moving at the speed of innovation and not the speed of government. That's my personal opinion. Anyways, guys, what do you think? Down below, I wanna hear from you. Do you think that they're going to move forward with launching another Starship this year? Or are they going to wait until next year and maybe use this time for the rest of 2023, maybe improving their current setup over at Boca Chica, maybe by adding another Starship launch pad, or maybe focusing on the space coast of Florida so that at Cape Canaveral, they can also start building a Starship launch base there. What do you think is going to happen moving forward? Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have, throw it a thumbs up. That'll be very helpful. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not. If you are subscribed, click this little button over here and then click all. So when I go live or when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. If you wanna say thank you for all of my hard work, there's a little thank you button down here. You can give a dollar or two if you like. If not, that's fine. Consider becoming a member of the channel. That would be even better. If you want more Starlink content, I put together a playlist. I'll put a link right there. Check that out. There is a ton, over 200 videos just on Starlink 
Check those out. Also, if you need a VPN, check out Pure VPN. The nice folks over there gave us a promo code, which is jchristina, or you could use the URL jchristina.com forward slash VPN to get 15 additional percent off at checkout. And finally, head over to my website jchristina.com where you can find all the photography tools I've invented for you and me over the many years. And if there's something there that you like, please consider picking it up and supporting me and my family. That's it, guys. I'm out of here for you another vlog. Many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you in the next one. Love you all. 